so today we have our guest speaker, the Urban Design Coordinator and Historic Preservation Officer for the City of Las Vegas. And she's going to be doing a presentation on historic preservation. It's going to build on some of what you have been reading. And she's going to be talking specifically as the Historic Preservation Officer for the City. So I am hoping that you will be taking ideas for your final paper for as she discusses the work that she's been doing there in Las Vegas for the last 12 years. She's a native Nevadan. She has her undergraduate degree from UNLV and she has a master's in historic preservation from Columbia, probably the top historic press school in the country. And so we're very lucky to have her today. And so let's all pay attention to what she has to tell us. But my dad still reminds me, oh, I guess Columbia is okay. It's behind Harvard and Yale. <laughs> so, okay, so I, um, thank you guys. Thank you for having me. Um, and um, just wanted to give a shout out to Margo. My, my, she drags me into all of these really fun things and uh, my job would be otherwise very dull without Margo. Um, so, some of this is very dry, and I apologize ahead of time because I, you know, part of my goal is to just let you guys really realize that it's not all swooping into old buildings and restoring them and then taking all sorts of credit for it. Um, there's a lot of work that goes into historic preservation uh, on the back end, and, and you have to have a lot of laws and all sorts of those types of fun things in place before you can actually get to the real fun stuff of historic preservation. And I asked Margo what she had gone over. She said some of the stuff that I'm going to go over she's mentioned or, or you have read about in your chapter. So this might um, be familiar to you. And um, if not, uh, you know, feel free to ask questions. Um, it's always good to break it up every now and then with a question. So don't be shy. So, um, and I try to throw pictures in all my slides, so at least you have something to look at besides words. So the, okay, so legislative background. Now this is for, this is federal and state, and then also what the city has, and Arizona might be slightly different. I understand that Arizona has, you're not allowed to designate historic properties um, with a zoning overlay anymore. They changed that law a few years ago, so um, the only thing that's available to um, historic properties here is state and um, national register. I don't know the specifics about you that. You do a voluntary overlay. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. Huh. So, um, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, way back in the 1960s, uh, the National Historic Preservation Act uh, was, was pretty much uh, inspired by the demolition of Penn, uh, um, Penn Station in New York City and that just was kind of a call to arms because it was such an historically significant building and we realized we didn't really have any kind of laws in place to protect historic buildings. So that sort of birthed the National Register um, it, um, 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 of Historic Places it, which is overseen by the National Park Service and the National Register is just a list of significant properties. It does not have any impact on, histor on your property in terms of you know, property rights issues, There's, there are no takings issues, those types of things. It is just a list of buildings that are considered historically significant to the nation. And the Act also established a legal framework for the state and tribal historic preservation offices which we, we, we call SHPOs and TIPOs. We also in Nevada have Nevada revised statutes and those give us the authority to have an ordinance and, and an historic preservation commission. The Nevada revised statutes also require cities of a certain population to have a, um, a um, master plan and an element of which would be the um, historic preservation plan. So we have all of those things in place. Now our state historic preservation office, just like most <coughs> historic preservation offices, they administer the certified local government program, which I'll explain in a second. They review the National Register of Historic Places and state register nominations. They maintain data on historic properties and they consult with federal agencies during section 106 review. I'll mention that as well in the future. And they um, implement a state marker program and do other sort of, um, have other sort of programs that recognize historic properties. The act was amended in 1980 to create the Certified Local Government Program. And this program is, uh, allows local governments to participate in the National Register Program. 
The role of the CLGs um, include, they have to uh, enforce and administer historic preservation laws, they have to maintain an inventory, they have to uh, participate in the National Register program, um, and on the flip side, the SHPOs will provide funding for, to administer some of these programs. So, for instance, the city of Las Vegas gets funding every year to do historic resource surveys, and we, do, we maintain our inventory using this funding. And by that, we also meet our Nevada Revised Statutes requirements, which requires us to maintain the inventory. And then all sorts of projects come out of that. So once you know what you have, then you have to work hard to save it. So in order to be part of the CLG program, you have to have a plan element, you have to have an historic preservation commission and an officer um, and an ordinance. And once again, the benefit is that you have technical assistance from SHPOs and uh, priority status for the grants. And one of our um, survey projects was a World War II. Recently, we just completed our World War II historic context survey in Nevada, most of, or in Las Vegas. Most of the housing stock in Las Vegas um, came out of World War II because we had a lot of people that were moving to Las Vegas to go to work in the military industry. We had uh, basic magnesium that was making magnesium ingots for melting down. They made planes and, and bomb casings out of the magnesium until they found out it was really flammable. Oops. Um, and then we also had Nellis, uh, which is, it was the, started as the uh, Air Army Gunnery Range and then it uh, became Nellis Air Force Base. So Las Vegas was declared a defense city and that gave us a lot of priority funding on housing. So we have a huge chunk of housing stock that was built during World War II. And we just completed a big report where we identified these homes and uh, the special features of the homes, the architectural features, uh, the materials of the homes, um, you know, the planning of the homes. Some of the plans were very um, forward thinking for their time. They were based on uh, Federal Housing Administrative uh, Administration principles. It, they required curvilinear streets and tree-lined streets and those types of things. So um, we're working with those neighborhoods now to see if they're interested in historic designation. And that's... What year did you use as a cutoff? Uh, the war period, so it was 42 to 46, I think. Okay, just to 46. Yeah, okay. um, but but we can go back and look at those individual neighborhoods. So, um, kind of a sidebar, but they if if some of them put on a lot of additions because you know it was the baby boomer thing. So right after the war, they started closing in their carports or you know turning their garages into bedrooms and things like that. So those things that occurred like right after the war, we will look at as in terms of whether or not they would. Um, <coughs> have an impact on the eligibility of the homes for being listed in, an, in a district because it's a direct impact from the war. So as I mentioned before, we have in Las Vegas the Historic Properties and Neighborhoods Preservation Plan Element. And just like any other plan element you will run across in your life, it um, has um, goals and policies and objectives. Um, it came from a long um, planning process involving the public and people who are interested in historic preservation and of course the Historic Preservation Commission and they identified those things that were very important to them um, one of which was developing this World War II context another one is to really research um, a more uh, a broader um, range of, of histories in Las Vegas so more African-American history more Hispanic history and then start developing programs that would interpret these um, histories now, as the Historic Preservation Officer, I serve as secretary to the HPC, which basically means I do all the staff reports, and now I have help doing the, um, or I do the agenda, and I have help doing the staff reports. Uh, but uh, for the longest time, I did all of that, and then you, you go to the meetings, and then you basically do what you're told, and uh, you get back to your desk, and you, you lick your wounds, and you figure out how you're going to get all this done. Um, so that's secretary. <laughs> uh, I administer the historic designation ordinance. I administer uh, or implement the plan, maintain our um, inventory, make sure that we keep doing inventory. I sponsor city-owned historic building designation applications and rehab projects and any maintenance policies. And I ensure compliance with federal, um, uh, state, federal and state requirements and, of course, the public outreach component. Our Historic Preservation Commission is made up of 11 members and we have nine required positions. Architecture, urban design, building construction, real estate, Nevada history, archaeology, 
representatives of a local historic preservation organization and established historic district, and a SHPO appointee. And we're really lucky because our commission, many of them are involved in a lot of outside preservation organizations and um, uh, other you know, events that are going on. And it really helps us to create kind of a network in the community and, and support for some of the projects and programs that they want to do. <coughs> um, before I go on, are there any questions? No? Nope? All right. So the powers and duties. Now, <coughs> even though it's a local ordinance and its designation is a zoning overlay, our commission is only a recommending board. So their powers are pretty limited in terms of what they can do. They, they, they make recommendations to planning and city council, um, a planning commission city council on various um, actions. Um, which can be overturned, and we've seen that with uh, district designations and, and other larger projects that are maybe somewhat contentious. So it, it's, they have teeth, but the teeth can be taken away from them shortly after they bite, <laughs> if that makes any sense. Don't they approve like the windows and the modifications? To the <coughs> well, yes, but there's still an appeal. So no appeal, yeah. yeah, there's still the appeal process. So, um, and we'll get into that as well. Um, they do all, they, they initiate historic surveys, they develop the public outreach um, programs, um, make recommendations to city council, and they also provide some technical assistance for property owners who want to make changes to their homes. For designated historic property owners, I should say. So in Las Vegas, we have three types of historic designation. We have the City of Las Vegas Historic Property Register, which we call the local um, designation. We have state and national registers. The Again, the national and state listings, they identify buildings or sites as being um, significant and the local register um, protects these properties with, with an overlay. And currently we have 182 parcels listed on our local register and 163 are within historic districts. And the majority of that is within our one residential historic district that's on the local property, uh, local historic property register, and that's the John S. Park neighborhood. We have a couple of parks that have multiple property, multiple buildings on the park uh, site itself that we consider districts because they have um, more than one building. And we have all kinds of resources. We have signs, we have archeological resources, we have a locomotive, um, you know, again, we have parks, we have a cemetery, so we have a pretty broad range of, of resources. Now, if you wanted to designate your property on the local uh, register as an individual, you would um, make an application to me um, and I would review it and make sure that it's, uh, you know, somewhat worthy of going forward to be reviewed by the Historic Preservation Commission. There's public notice process. Um, the HPC reviews the application and uh, it goes to planning commission and then plan uh, they make a recommendation to planning commission. Planning commission reviews it, they make a recommendation to city council and city council is final action. There is an appeal period, but you know, at any point along the way, that process can be derailed by planning commission or city council. The um, applicant has to submit a statement of eligibility. And we used to kind of accept these things on napkins. I sort of have changed this a little. Um, I now require sources. So um, it's a little intimidating to the grandmother who wants to put her house on the, on the um, register. So I usually offer to help her or I can point her to a nonprofit who will help um, some of these people just work through that process. Um, the criteria is essentially if you're, if you're eligible for listing on the National Register or the State Register, you're automatically eligible for the local register. A significant portion of the building would have to be at least 40 years old. So we do allow for some additions. It depends on if the addition is compatible with the existing historic architecture. And is the building reflective of the city's cultural, social, political, or economic past? Is it associated with someone important um, in Las Vegas history or state or national history? Or does the building have some kind of great um, architectural significance? And 
these buildings are all listed locally uh, in Las Vegas. Um, you know, and the, and the one on the left, you can kind of see this is a great sort of, um, you know, Tudor revival looking uh, building and it's very cute. It was probably built in the 30s. That's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, Fifth Street School, um, just a great photo. It was a mission revival school, but it's got this great patio and that's another beautiful gem. And then the Mesquite Club, which is kind of on the fence and you sort of have to push the boundaries, but the Mesquite Club themselves um, were a club that were the oldest club in Las Vegas. They were 100 years old when they were designated. They started in 1905 or 8. They had done a tremendous, it was a ladies like, you know, organization. They had done a tremendous amount of work in Las Vegas in that 100 years and they had some of the earliest founders of Las Vegas as members of this, uh, this club. So it was more associated with the history of the club instead of um, the history of the building itself. And important to remember is that nowhere does it say anywhere in even state and national listing <coughs> criteria will it say that condition of the building is a factor. Uh, because we, we hear that a lot. We say, oh, that thing's ready to fall down and why would we even consider that? This particular building, the Harrison Boarding House, was built somewhere, we're not sure, in the 30s and moved to the historic west side of Las Vegas in the 40s to be a boarding house for the African-American entertainers who could not stay on the strip in the hotels that they were performing at. So very famous people, Sammy Davis Jr. stayed here, Lena Horne, a number of really famous African-American entertainers stayed here. And you can see the original part of the house from the 30s is this part on the left. And then they started just building things on in the 40s to accommodate more paying guests. But you look at it now and it doesn't really seem like anything and then you, you see the history of it and it's really quite an important building. So for a district, the, the statement of eligibility is pretty similar. Um, more we're looking at uh, is there a substantial con contribution uh, or excuse me, concentration of contributing buildings that still represent the overall distinctive character of the area and are united historically or visually by um, you know, plan or physical development. We like our districts to have cute little nice borders, um, documented historic boundaries, or perhaps it's the original plat map, something of that nature, it kind of makes it easier. And also the plat boundaries can help you um, um, when you when you take a plat map out into a neighborhood, then you start seeing how the different neighborhoods develop. So it is pretty clear where even if there's you know two houses right next to each other that one was probably part of this plat and is united with these other ones architecturally uh, rather than the other area. So that's um, that's important and that helps define your boundaries. And then other things like rivers or, or other um, you know natural boundaries can can help define that district. The process is pretty much the same. The only thing that changed, and this came as a direct result of a failed attempt to designate an historic district in Las Vegas, is that we now require a minimum of three public meetings with the neighborhood that is seeking designation. And one of those meetings has to be a design charrette or a workshop of some nature where the property owners can bring images of their homes to me and or a sketch or whatever and they say hey I want to put a garage on my house how would I be able to do that if this were designated an historic district and we can you know lay the trace out and we sketch you know what it might look like and I, I went through this with a neighborhood just last year and they were really shocked at the um, flexibility that we had with allowing these types of additions and changes to the homes obviously we want the changes to be compatible with you know, the historic architecture of the, of the neighborhood, but we're not talking about, you know, on the East Coast where you, or San Francisco where you have these, you know, Victorians, we're talking mid-century modern where if you want to put a square, um, you know, garage on, that's perfectly compatible for the most part. So, um, so I think, and, and I credit that with Margot because we were up in front of a room and they were asking us if we could do things and we were like, well, I don't know. And Margot said, we need to uh, implement this. So great I idea. I said it unpleasantly, didn't I? Oh, no. <laughs> Most sweetly. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, it's worked out so far. Um, I think property owners feel a lot more comfortable when they have that face-to-face. Uh, -face. So, um, you know, what are some of the things that we look at? When we're looking at an historic district, 
what are some of the things, some of the changes that might impact uh, whether or not it's eligible? Um, carport additions, you know, especially on a home uh, like the one in the upper left, which was built in the late 30s, probably um, at the most, you know, early 40s, and that carport is just not quite doing it for me with that architecture. Um, once again, if this were a mid-century modern home, just a plain kind of, you know, flat carport might be appropriate, but in this home, it's, it's really not. Um, things like, it's hard to see in that middle picture, but it's uh, like trellis that they had put up in front of the house. Now this is removable, but the problem is you can't see if the building has its original windows, so it's really hard to make a determination if it's uh, eligible or not. Um, the far right, that should be pretty obvious, that weird towery thing where they put the entrance um, is just not compatible with the architecture. And then, you know, really um, uh, inappropriate infill, giant buildings where you can see um, it's very modern, and, and that's not so bad, but here's your little tiny one-story house right next to it, and um, yeah. that's uh, the Las Vegas High School District. Yeah, they're just, the MIC offices are popping up. Mm. And that's a good example, actually, of a National Register District because you can do whatever you want with that district, um, and they can build all sorts of giant buildings uh, next to these little tiny homes. So once you're listed on the local register, what happens? Um, basically, any work that requires a permit or a, uh, a for a building permit or a zoning permit is subject to review uh, based on the design guidelines or uh, based on the uh, historic designation ordinance. And it's review, I review all the applications first. The applicant submits a, an application for a certificate of appropriateness to me. And then I make a determination of whether the work is minor or major. Major work is usually work that is over, I think, 25% of the square footage of the lot. Um, and at that point, you know, if it's, if, it's, if it's minor, I can probably review it administratively, and then there's in and out in one day. <coughs> if it's major, um, it, it has to go to the Historic Preservation Commission. So I send out a nice little letter every year to everyone um, who has a property listed on the local register with the flowchart and big, you know, bold letters in the letter. Please call me when you the second you wake up and think you want to do something to your home because I don't want to, I don't want to be the process that puts you behind a year because you didn't come to me and then you know then we have to go through that uh, misery. Um, so you know the earlier they come to me the better and we can probably get them out. Most projects are very easy to take care of in a day. We actually get more admin approvals than anything. Um, with, um, with the district, um, we review uh, the applications for compatibility with the recognized distinctive character of the overall landmark district site building structure or object. Within a district, the building must, the, the work must be compatible with the distinctive character of the individual resource as well as the district, and it must meet any applicable design guidelines. Proposed work on non-contributing resources um, are held to district standards only. And this is an, an example, this building here in the middle. Um, <coughs> our neighborhood president called me in a panic and said, there's piles of, there's uh, pallets with Spanish tile stacked in front of the house and there are no you know precedents there's no precedents whatsoever for spanish tile in this in this 1940s uh, housing development which basically had you know the asphalt tile roofing for every home so um you know it took us a while we went back and forth code enforcement went over and told the the owner she had to go to the hpc and she didn't respond and by the time we got around to it they had already put the roof on well the contractor came around it happened like in a day. The contractor came to the HPC and he said, I'll take it off. I'll replace it for free. My bad. I didn't come get a permit. And the HPC said, meh. So, yeah. So oh, now, okay. yeah, yeah. She, she was, you know, elderly and, you know. So, um, we have a very <laughs> flexible commission. <laughs> um, for better or for worse. Yes. Oh, sorry. So if, you know, if the lady, let's say she sells the house. Right. Um, you, have a new, you have a new person coming to buy it. Um, 
Are they obligated on, under any means to remove the Spanish no. style? No, no. We don't, re we don't require, and that's another question that's come up in a, in a district currently that is looking at designation is, do they have to take all the homes back to um, you know, the 50s? And not at all. It's just that if they want to make a significant change, we would like that change to be compatible with that mid-century architecture. This happens to be a mid-century neighborhood. It's not a Tudor neighborhood, but <laughs> we want all houses to look mid-century. Um, and so with, um, with that neighborhood, the John S. Park neighborhood, where I just showed you the Spanish tile example, uh, they adopted specific district design guidelines that have guidelines for each ar ar architectural style in the neighborhood. So, you know, if you're, <coughs> if you're a ranch house, um, you know, you might have a certain type of, of window, you might have um, an entrance, uh, you know, a certain, in a certain location. With those homes, most of them are kind of, they have this L-shaped plan, so we like to kind of maintain that um, rather than, you know, bringing the front of the house forward and making the front flat. So these are the types of things that we look at in um, that neighborhood. Other neighborhoods have just kind of adopted the um, general guidelines, which are the Secretary of the Interior Standards. Did you go over that with them? Secretary of the Interior? Okay. Secretary of the Interior Standards is, are the federal guidelines that they use to review federal projects, and we'll, we'll get into that. But they're very general. <coughs> so accommodations for ADA, uh, solar, and other green building technologies cannot be denied, and that's a state law, that's a federal law with ADA. Um, all we can do is recommend where we'd like to see it. We had an applicant come in, and they wanted to put all of their solar on the front of the house, and we kind of asked them if they could just push it back um, to the slopes that are more near the back of the house, um, and they were able to accommodate that. So again, we just met with them early and really tried to work out some of the issues before it went to the commission. And, oh, sure. Sorry, that's the same nationally, right, for ADA? I think so. Trump oh, yeah. Historic. Yeah, we... So there's um, there's a, a code in the international building or a chapter in the international building called code chapter 36 that deals with existing buildings and there's also an existing international existing building code or national existing code international okay um, that chapter has some flexibility so for instance with one of the buildings in Las Vegas that was recently rehabilitated it was a two-story building um, and they wanted to get rid of uh, one of the staircases in the front, and so they ended up having to put something in the back, and then they were able to put, you know, the ramp in um, along the side. So it's it's just one of those, it's not black and white, you have to start meeting early and talking about your, your options, but yes, you can't just say, we're not going to put a ramp in because this building is historic, and, you know, it'll make it look funny. So you can't get away with that. With this particular project, and these are not great photographs, because so, this Dern trees. Um, this house, this is the original house. Um, it was 980 square feet. So obviously you, you have a family, you know, that's really small. So they wanted to add 2,480 square feet. Do you remember this project, Margo? This is when you were there, okay. Um, this is in John S. Park. Okay. And all of this back here, um, it actually came all the way to the front here and I think half of this up here, and they have like a, the five foot setback, which is the minimum setback. So they have no more backyard. Um, and I met with them and I said, hey, you know, can you just push it back right here away from this corner, like 15 feet, so we can still read the original shape of the house. And then, you know, their, their um, garage was detached at the time and they wanted to make an attachment. I said, that's okay. You know, it's just pushed back a little bit so you can really read the house. So that's that's, you know, kind of a way of, of allowing the property owners to, um, you know, have their needs met as well as maintaining the historic character. Cake. Exactly. We like cake. So National Register, um, we, we got, the local register, we got our criteria, it's based loosely on the National Register. Um, so they're, they're very, very similar. Um, we don't administer the National Register program. If somebody wants something listed on the National Register, they uh, submit it to the State Historic Preservation Office. 
they work with the applicant and then that, that nomination comes to the local um, um, commission just to kind of proofread it essentially and they, they accept the report and then they say, yeah, this is great, we agree with it and then it moves up forward with the national register process. But again, um, their criteria is very similar and we have a number of national register sites in Las Vegas as well. National Register has seven aspects of integrity. Location is the place where the historic property was constructed or where the historic event occurred. Design is the combination of elements that create the form, the plan, space, structure, and style of a property. Setting is the physical environment of the property, so whether it's in a park or you know, um, a historic um, subdivision. Materials are the physical elements um, that uh, were combined or deposited during a particular period of time. So it's essentially in, in the built environment it would be, you know, is the building made of concrete or wood or whatever. Workmanship is the physical evidence of the crafts of a particular culture or people. And feeling is a property's expression of the aesthetic or historic sense of a particular period of time. Association is the direct link between an, an important historic event or a person or property. Um, and this particular um, example is the Berkeley Square neighborhood. It's located in, um, the, in historic West Side. It was built in 1954. It was the first, quote unquote, first integrated neighborhood in Las Vegas because at the time we were um, pretty officially and unofficially segregated. And, and again, most of the wartime housing because it was built to FHA standards, um, the FHA was, um, they would not be involved in a project that um, was not segregated at the time. So this forced a lot of the African American population to live in the west side. And when they built this um, subdivision, it was the first time that many of the residents of the west side had running water and an inside toilet. So this was a huge big deal to um, the west side. So we looked at this, it was designed by Paul Williams, he's an internationally known, um, renowned uh, um, African American architect. He did the LAX, uh, he, was, he partnered on the theme building at LAX, um, a number of buildings in Las Vegas, and um, famous for kind of stars homes in Southern California and municipal buildings. He was very well known. He also did, um, was very good at D designing small spaces that were functional. So they, they hired him to do this. We really didn't know, we didn't really have proof that he was the architect other than it matched exactly what he had in his, um, these current homes matched exactly what he had in his books that he had published. Um, and there was a loose connection to it earlier on in the project before it changed hands. So we went to the National Register and we're like, we're not even really sure he's the architect, but we're pretty sure. And by the way, the integrity of almost all of the homes has been compromised. Uh, but um, because we had um, such similar architecture and because he had been mentioned in the earliest plans before the subdivision changed hands, the National Register agreed that he, um, they made the leap that he is the architect of these homes. And because of its association with civil rights in Las Vegas, they listed it on the National Register. So this is a really good example of, again, um, a neighborhood that has maybe not uh, stellar architectural integrity, but has a really strong association to something very important that happened in our history. Um, again, with, uh, with um, Paul Williams, he designed the La Concha, which used to be on the Strip. You can see it in its original location in the postcard on the left. It's now the lobby for the Neon Museum. It was moved in 2005. Um, and it's a moved building, so now it's been taken out of its location, its uh, setting, its, you know, all these things have changed. The workmanship has possibly changed because we had to cut it into 11 pieces uh, to move it, but the, um, it, this National Register nomination is pending, so um, we're hoping that that uh, goes through. So, um, do we have time? I can talk about Section 106 or, okay. So, Section 106 is, is one of the more interesting um, aspects of my job because uh, the Federal Re Review stuff is always fun to kind of pick through. Um, Section 106 is, it requires the federal government basically to take into account their impacts um, that they might have on historic buildings for any project that they're doing. So, if they want to build a highway through an historic neighborhood, they have to take into account that that neighborhood might be impacted um, and how can they mitigate those impacts. I work 
less with those larger projects and more with these individual projects where we might get federal funding to rehabilitate a building. And one of these examples is the um, Mob Museum in Las Vegas, which is the official name is the National Museum of Organized Crime and Law Enforcement. It was built in 1933, and we kind of had the triple whammy because the, the General Services Administration sold us, sold us the building for a dollar, so we had that federal nexus. We had federal tax credits, um, and it was a, um, and some other federal funding. So we, and it's listed on the National Register, so we had the triple whammy where they were, um, very specific about the things that we could and could not do in the building. And of course, you're turning a post office into a major tourist attraction. So all of the exhibits had to be floating. Every single thing that was done had to be reversible. So one example is we had to restore all of the finishes that had been removed at some point. Like the plaster ceilings, we had to have a master plasterer come in and restore all the ceilings that we then covered up with a fake ceiling for the museum. Another job, um, I, I have a side gig. I work for the Bureau of Reclamation in Boulder City and I, I help them manage their historic properties and they're a federal uh, agency, so of course they've got to comply with this Section 106. And they, um, this is an historic district, the little green area, those two buildings are in the historic district. Uh, and this is an original picture of their campus that started construction in the 30s when they were building Hoover Dam. Um, they went through a programmatic agreement with uh, the feds, the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, and then local uh, preservation advocates. And what came out of that was that any new construction had to be compatible with the historic architecture of the industrial campus, this stuff which is corrugated metal, and the historic architecture of the district. So um, essentially any new buildings, like if you can see here, you know, this was, we would want any new buildings to, you know, be aligned this way, be, be, uh, have a massing of an industrial building. We had to pull out the specific qualities that we thought were key elements of, of the historic buildings. So what we came up with um, is the green building. So this is where all of their offices are now combined on, in a new campus. The green building on, um, that's the new building on the right, uh, the front of it is all concrete and it has um, the lines of windows that mimic the admin building, which is their admin building in Boulder City that was built in the 30s. So that part is the part that faces the historic district and is compatible with the historic architecture of the district. This half, which is corrugated metal, is the part that faces the campus. And it actually turned out really well. When the, guy, when the contractors came in and they're like, this is what we're gonna do, we laughed and we thought this is gonna look terrible. But it, it turned out really nice. You have this kind of, what, this feeling of a purpose-built industrial architecture on the one side that's kind of rambling. And then you have you know, you know, the big windows. And then on the other side, you have this more traditional, formal architecture. And how they joined them so that it was clear, you know, if you're, that this, w this was on purpose, is they kind of made this big reveal here where the concrete um, extends past the corrugated metal. So another, you know, just small detail, but it shows um, that the building is not historic. So that's the historic preservation in a nutshell. <laughs> the nuts and bolts, do, uh, do you have any questions? Do you find it more difficult to deal with neighborhoods and districts or with individual projects, would you say? Because with a neighborhood, you have a whole bunch of people yeah. getting involved. But with individual projects, you also have a lot of other people who might be getting involved. So it's just one thing. Um, individual, uh, right. There's always the benefit of having the, 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 prop, the one property owner that's going to be impacted coming to you and saying they want their building um, designated. The only tough situation there is if you really feel that it doesn't qualify and then you kind of have to break the news to them gently. Um, and sometimes with, with the notification process, because we have a, a radius, you have people that are opposed because they think it's like a cancer and they don't want it to spread to their house. Um, but that's very rare. The districts, of course, um, it, it's a long process. I mean, we've been working with Beverly Green now for probably four mm -hmm. years and they're still collecting signatures and of course as people move then you have to go to the new property owners and see if they're 
in support and we may look at changing some of the uh, process based on just this recent um, experience with Beverly Green. But Beverly Green um, is an interesting example because half of that neighborhood is in a gaming overlay which was not supposed to extend into a residential area. So we're not really sure how that happened. Um, we're looking at that now. But at one time, you know, I don't know, back in the 90s or something, these big casinos came to the property owners and they said, we'll give you $6 million for your home. Well, we haven't had one single application from a casino developer to develop any of that. But yet, there's still, this is 20 years later, these people are still hanging on to this, that somebody's going to come and give them two to six million dollars for their properties. And it's just not going to happen. So um, we're looking at now how we can uh, move back the gaming overlay to be, a, you know, to more of a commercial area um, to give the property owners, you know, they'll have kind of realistic expectations of the value of their property. So that's the main sticking point with that particular neighborhood. But yes, Oh, and with Vegas, with everything being new, you have the, how can this be old? I built this home, uh, you know, in the 40s, so. Well, you also have, Courtney may not want it. The <laughs> horror story of the one designated district that we do have, the people had come to uh, Johnna's Park. They had come to us. They wanted it. The city said, okay, we'll look into it. You do all the studies. You do all the hearings. You have all the meetings. And then you have, do you... Were you there for the first meeting, the one for? I don't think so. Um, Brian Scott lost his mind. No. Okay, so we had. The, uh, <laughs> That's funny. We had the, the last meeting before we went to planning commission for adoption, so we're almost all done, and it had been a big love fest up until then. So the last meeting, that guy that wanted to turn his property into commercial, right next to the banquet hall. <coughs> So this one guy comes, and he, again, had visions of all this money that was going to come to him because he was going to have his property rezoned to commercial. And he had found a couple of other people that just hadn't been involved during the first two years that this was going on. And he came, and the whole meeting blew up. Absolutely blew up. People are screaming, you're, you know, this is America, you're taking away our property rights. <laughs> well, the... The deputy city attorney, who was assigned to land use issues, really didn't know anything, well, didn't know anything about land use issues, but he also didn't know anything about historic <laughs> preservation. And so he's standing there, and these people are getting all pissed off, and all of a sudden, so we're planning, all well, the planners are trying to think of, well, what are we going to do to calm this situation down? And the city attorney goes off and starts telling him he doesn't want to hear it and you can't talk this way. And we're trying to get him out of the room because, like Courtney says, you, you go along on these processes and you think that everything's fine and then it blows up at the last minute. And it really only takes one yeah. that can then spark the entire neighborhood into, well, gee, nobody told us we could rezone and turn into commercial and la di da di which of course wasn't true. <laughs> but it, it only takes one to, to take a calm and peaceful and kumbaya process and turn it into a war zone. And you never know who's going to spark even the city attorney. Well, and they said, some people said that they had not been to any of the meetings, but we had photographs right. of them. They were, they were photocopying signature right, pages. signatures, well, well, I, would that be you? That, let's see, there's that meeting, oh, and then that one, and then, oh my gosh, look, here you are again. Well, they were, they were photo, remember they were photocopying yeah, the yeah. petition yes. in, of opposition handed all these crumpled papers to Margo, and it was like this. <laughs> she said, I know there's not that many property owners, and they're <laughs> photocopies. So, you know, and it's misinformation. Like, you can't paint your house. Well, you can paint your house whatever you want. It's uh, a, a historic press on both sides of the issue. You have the advocates that are, as we always say, uh, report to a higher authority because historic preservation is the, the realm of godliness. So to those who are advocates, they report to a higher authority. And then you have those that this is America, I can do with my house whatever you want to, to which you, we say, yes, you still can, but they don't want to hear it. Because somebody has put the bug in the ear that Steve Wynn is going to come to them and build the brand new Bellagio on their 50 by 100 lot. <laughs> Somehow or the other. Somehow or the other. Any other questions for Courtney? 
I have one more war story for you to tell. I mean, she doesn't know how I'm going to do this. <laughs> tell them about your current situation. Oh, uh, which one? The street, the street going through. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> uh, oh, well, you know, I have that a picture of the building in the other PowerPoint. Yeah, you do. So what we have Should I build here, it up or? So what we have is the, the city's um, cultural corridor area, which is where we have our museums and uh, the city's library, the Natural History Museum, and a city building that's been there since? Uh, 1963. 1963. You, it was the former city hall, yeah. built as an LDS church, former city hall. And now it's, it's across from our minor league baseball stadium in this area of all these activities. And it is a playhouse. They have plays there. Kids go there to learn how to play musical instruments. They learn drama. They put on plays, and it's owned by the city. But the city, it's this building right here, but the city, like everybody else, has visions of what they're going to do. And Ms. Mooney will tell you about where we are now. So um, actually, I can kind of, if I go back to this map here, it's not the best map, but the vision is to put light rail up this street here, which is Maryland Parkway, have it go up and up and up and up, and then it's going to cut, I guess it does keep, have it in here, kind of where it says Cultural Corridor Trail, it's going to cut across, and they're at, calling at this... At Cashman? Yes, at Cashman. At the, at the baseball field. Right, and it's going to be called the Cultural Vista Boulevard or whatever, mm -hmm. and then it's going to come back down into downtown, and this is the link, the, the light rail connection into downtown. To the BRT. Yes, pretty sure. Um, so they've decided that it would be a really good idea for the road to go right here and lop off this whole wing of this building. Now this 1963 building is virtually architecturally intact. It's, it's had these wood panels here that were put over the, the original tile. It's, um, it's in really beautiful shape and part of the whole um, charm of it is its symmetricality. So um, it's one of those things where, you know, a few years from now, people are going to look at that and say, what were they thinking? You know, why was it so important to put that road there? Uh, so our uh, ordinance allows the Historic Preservation Commission to comment on um, uh, projects that might impact historic buildings in Las Vegas. And it's, like I said, they are just a recommending board. They have no teeth whatsoever. They can only say, they can even pass a resolution that says, I oppose, we as a commission oppose the lopping off of the southern wing of the Reed Whipple building. Um, and that doesn't really do anything other than put them formally on the record as opposing this action. Um, so I recommended to my um, manager and I said, you know, we, we really need to bring this to the commission because if we don't, and they lop that southern half off, and we never get a road there, and then years later the commission finds out, or you know, two weeks after it's lopped off, they find out about it, it's gonna be crazy. And our, um, our uh, chairman of the Historic Preservation Commission was for many years uh, the news manager of one of the channels, and then he was like VP news manager, or VP of news for Sunbelt Communications, which is huge uh, all over California, Arizona. Um, Utah, and so he's very well connected to the media, and anytime anything happens, he shows up with a news crew. So I thought, let's save ourselves the embarrassment. Let's go to the commission. Let's get it over with. Let's take our beating. Let's take their resolution, which means nothing, and get on with our lives. <laughs> and um, all chaos is occurring right now over this decision because now the commission wants to see alternatives, and they want... Um, uh, they basically want us to come to them and say why it can't go someplace else, which I think is reasonable. Um, and um, so we, we're kind of in the middle of this right now. We don't, we don't know where it's going to happen, but if I get fired, you'll see me guest lecturing a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> the, the interesting story here to me is the, the staff members that in this instance are saying, well, let's just hurry up and do it. Let's lop that puppy off. Courtney, quit being a naysayer. Quit, quit being the historic preservation officer. Quit doing your job. Those same people were the people that fought so hard and spent so much money on the Mob Museum 
to bring that building back to what it is today. So people aren't always one way or the other. The same folks that might be a historic preservation advocate on one project can turn around a few minutes later and say, well, why are they commenting on this? What's it to them? We don't want them to get in the way of progress. So it isn't as though people, this might become a shock to you younger persons, but Courtney and I have learned that people are not always consistent. <laughs> people are not always consistent. Those same people who can argue one way, one day, on one issue, can the next argue just as fervently the opposite perspective. And that's exactly where, when Courtney was telling me this story last night, all I kept thinking in the back of my head was, because of course we know the people, golly, isn't that the same person that was willing to die <laughs> to get the post office building refurbished back to the gnat's eyelash of going to the original designer of the chandelier features to have them reconstructed yeah. so that they were the exact replicas of the chandeliers that were in the original building. Well, there's no money in this building. Mm -hmm. And that's the key thing, right? The Mob Museum had a plan and it was going to generate revenue. This building, we cannot get at least to save our lives. The Shakespeare Theater folks moved out. It's been empty for a couple of years. It's in a location that's been difficult. Yeah. It's in a location that prior to the crash, there were a lot of residential and mixed-use buildings that were actually approved right in that area. That mm -hmm. one site I love that's above the library right. that has like the views, All the views to die yeah. for. So this was an area that prior to the crash it had a lot of hope, but now post-crash it's not first on the list. Right? It's not first on the list. And so they now have a different idea. And so all those same principles of truth, justice, and historical preservation now are just naysayers in the way of progress from the same persons, <laughs> just a few years difference. So historic prez, I always told Courtney she had the best job in the world. Twelve years later, she says she's not so sure. but. <laughs> It's still the best job. It's still the best job. But, you know, sometimes you have the best job and you're happy to give it to somebody else. <laughs> um, it has tremendous wins, and then it has great potential for losses. Soul-crushing losses. And we used, to, we used to joke, did you, we, our pith helmets? Yeah. We have real pith helmets, and we would say that we needed to put on our pith helmets <laughs> When we went to the HPC meeting, because you never knew, whatever we did wasn't right, it wasn't enough, we were inaccurate, there was more research to be done, and so even doing your very best, you were never sure if the people that you were working for and with might not feel that it was never enough. And of course, those that disagreed, it was way too much. And that's part of what historic press is. I've replaced my pith helmet with something uh, you're that offers much more protection. Think, yeah, it's just a fascinating. <laughs> it's like having a an odd critter in the classroom. <laughs> so, any more questions for Courtney? Okay, thank you very much, and we're gonna.